knew who all the players right. you know uh let's see this is uh, got it okay um the players of my era knew who all the players were before us mm-hmm. like knew, knew the type of player they were uh position the teams you know that they played on honestly the last thing i mean I don't even with the technology we have, all you got to do is just hit that World Wide Web thing and players now you can, you know, you can find out any information you want. But a lot of players are like, oh, I never heard of that guy. I'm like, never heard of the guy. The guy played like 800 games in the NHL. It's like it's hard to believe. But yeah, look at that was it was it was it, I was in awe, you know, look at like playing against Wayne Gretzky for the first time, um, you know, going up against, uh, you know, um, you know, players of, of, uh, of that, uh, of that stature that you grew up watching and you're like, wow, I mean, there's the, you know, arguably the greatest player in the history of the national hockey league. And all of a sudden you're playing against them in the conference finals, your rookie year in the NHL in 1985. So, uh, it, it can be intimidating, but at the end of the day, it's just another hockey game. You got to go out and play and, and something you'll always remember. We're talking on the, uh, the day, the, the Seattle Kraken is, uh, yeah putting together their roster. It's expansion day. It's, it's exciting for sure. But do you think that now, you know, there, there used to be the original six and then, yeah. you know, up to 12, it was just, it was easier because there were fewer names to remember. Sure. You know, you know and now, especially with the international aspect, it's hard to keep track of where guys are coming up. I mean, forever, yeah. it was just the Canadian juniors. So you follow sure. the juniors, you could learn about these kids before they even broke into the league. Now you got, I mean, you got leagues all over the place that they're plucking players from. Cause I'm looking at the expansion list and I'm a pretty, you know, avid hockey fan. And I'm going to say, I know maybe 50% of these names. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's fair. Um, players are coming. I think that's what makes our league the greatest league in the world is because, you know, we are getting all the best players now and things have really changed over the years. And, uh, you know, you're right. Expansion draft and full disclosure here. I have some, uh, I have some blood and skin in the game in Seattle. My, uh, my brother, Ricky is vice president, assistant general manager with the great Ron Francis mm-hmm. uh, on the, on the pro side and obviously overseeing everything. And then my oldest son, Eddie is an amateur scout uh, with the Kraken. So they'll have their draft coming up this weekend. So I'm very much invested uh, on a lot of levels, uh, hoping that Seattle and look at, I mean, you look at the job that Ronnie Francis and my brother did in Carolina uh, before they both got let go there. I mean, the team in the team in Carolina, quite, quite frankly, except for maybe a, two players are all Ron Francis's players. And he did a hell of a job there. And yeah. I think he's going to do an amazing job there in Seattle. So it, it's exciting. I mean, hockey just ended what, 10 days, 12 days ago. And now we got the draft, the expansion draft, and now we got the amateur draft and then finally get the free agency. So uh, we're only, uh, we're less than uh, what, Puck drop, I think, is going to be October 12th this year, opening night. And, uh, you know, we're not that far away from hockey season. But I think to the heart of your question and what you were talking about, Zach, is, um, you know, if, if you're if you're a good player, uh, teams are going to find you now because there are so many teams. you got scouts all over the world and tough to kind of fall through the cracks as far as, you know, um, you know, any player, uh, you know, surfacing and all of a sudden, you know, becoming a, a full-time NHL or so it, it's, it's a global game. And, you know, I think that's great for the game. And hopefully once we can all get through this pandemic, it, it, you know, the game will flourish not only on the ice, but financially as well for all the owners. You mentioned that the Stanley cup finals just ended. And sometimes I feel like Eddie, they, the NHL is a bit cursed in who ends up in the finals. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So yeah, you, you have the Montreal Canadiens, a storied mm-hmm. franchise, of course. Mm-hmm. But when I when I think about it's because I'm 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 out here in California, constantly trying to win over hockey fans, right, or get new hockey fans. Yeah, yeah. And they they almost could have watched the Golden Knights, the Las Vegas Golden Knights versus the New York Islanders, and instead the NHL got the Tampa Bay Lightning, which is mm-hmm. a phenomenally good team, right. but has to have the smallest fan base of a phenomenally good team since the New Jersey Devils. Uh, do you ever just, are you ever like, yeah, this is going to be a good finals, which actually turned out to be kind of a mediocre in terms of competition, but uh, yeah. it'd be so good for the league if there were just two other franchises. Yeah, but you know what, though, Zach, I mean, I look at it, and, and having been at NBC for the last 15 and a half years and being in the in the lead chair as the analyst with the great Doc Emmerich for 14 of them, mm-hmm. and then Kenny Albert this last year when Doc retired. You know, I, I go back to the first one I was a part of, and, and I think that was in the 06 playoffs where 
we had Carolina and Edmonton. Uh, and it was, I mean, you could argue as good as a Stanley Cup final uh, excitement level that we've had in the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. You know, we had Anaheim and Ottawa one year. But you know what? We've had Chicago in there three times. We've had Boston in there a couple of times. Sure. We've had LA in there. We had the Rangers in there. So look at, I mean, you're going to get, you know, you're going to get the, the, you know, the prime uh, TV markets in there and then you're going to get smaller markets. And I think that, I think that's good. I, I think look at Pittsburgh. I mean, let's not forget Pittsburgh. I mean, they were in the Stanley cup final, what they've won three cups here and recently in back-to-back -back years, a few years ago. So look at Tampa is an unbelievable story and, and they've been the best team and, you know, you could argue, I said it you know, in the last game in game five, Zach, when I was doing the game on NBC, is that you could argue Vasilevsky, best goalie in, in the world. You could argue Victor Hedman, best defenseman in the world. And I would make the case, and I said it on television, is that you could argue that Braden Point and Nikita Kucherov are two of the top 10 players in the entire National That's Hockey right. League. Like, you, you, you can make that argument. Now, I would say, those four players are top 25 players in the entire national hockey league. And that's why they're on a run of winning two Stanley cups. And, you know, there's going to be a lot of changes there. They're going to, you know, they're going to miss their third line with Gord, Goudreau and Coleman. They're all going to be, you know, I think Gord's going to end up in Seattle probably. And then you're going to have Goudreau and Coleman leave for free agency. So, you know, they're going to have to replace and it's going to be harder, but, um, you know, Montreal, you know, I mean, they were offensively challenged all year. They were 18th overall in a regular season. They were fortunate to be in the Northern division, which, you know, was kind of soft compared to everywhere else. And look at if, if you're Toronto, you got to be kicking yourself in the rear end, or you mentioned Vegas, you got to be kicking yourself in the rear end and sit, but look, Montreal found a way. I mean, they got yeah. good goal running. They were tough. They were heavy and, uh, and neither team was able to, to respond. Toronto's big guys were cold. They didn't get the goaltending. Montreal did. And then that Vegas series, Vegas, I mean, I, I did the Colorado Vegas series uh, before the, the conference final there, Zach. And I looked at Vegas in that series against Colorado and then saw them play against Montreal. And I went, where in the hell did that team play? Right. Like, yeah. Like, I, 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 thought, I thought Colorado was going to smoke them. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, look at, you know, you just, I think that's what makes it, I think that's what makes our game just so incredible is that because if you just get in if you just get to the playoffs yeah and you can just find that little bit of something right and well, look, hot goalie I, yeah hot yeah, goalie. yeah hot goalie but you know look at i mean let's not forget montreal's penalty kill too i mean they were on a heater there where they killed, killed off like 35 or 35 and they were facing some pretty good teams i mean they faced toronto i mean winnipeg you know that once they lost shifley they were done you know vegas has got a really good power play and you know and they went a little you know they went cold in the playoffs so Timing's everything. So for me, yeah, it maybe wasn't the, you know, the, you know, the Boston, Chicago, or the, you know, the, you know, the Pittsburgh, uh, you know, Detroit or whatever it is, you know, you're going to have years like mm -hmm. that. But uh, I, I certainly believe is that, uh, you know, the, the best team certainly won. And, and, and that was Tampa Bay. Yeah, Tampa Bay is the best team in the league. It's not, yeah. it doesn't even feel close right now. You brought up Doc Emmerich's name. Yeah. The, it was, it was so easy again to, to sell people on the game when, Emmerich was broadcasting. I mean, just for me, the best play-by-play -play of all time in any sport. Yeah. Well, look at to sit next to him uh, for, for 15 years was uh, for 14 years, I guess, uh, was just, uh, you know, I told him at the end, I said, you know, you got, you got this 220 pound plus guy off your shoulder because you carried me for the last 14 years. <laughs> uh, I've seen a lot of players in the league get carried by guys, uh, you know, uh, for a long time. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I love being his partner. He's a great friend. Uh, he was with me through my most difficult times when I was battling stage three colon cancer a few years ago. And, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy for doc, uh, Zach, that he went out on his own terms. You mm -hmm. know, he's very much at peace. You know, we talk often, we text often. Um, you know, he just had a way to draw you in, he had a way to tell a story while the play was going on. And, and we, we had such a trust factor that uh, it was one of the things that I, you know, I expressed to him is that, you know, I, I'm going to have to earn your trust, but I promise you, I will always have your back. And uh, I've been paid a, you know, a few compliments in my life, but I think one of the ones I cherish the most, not only even as a player or as a broadcaster, but, 
you know, as, as Doc said, uh, you know, when he was on his way out, he said that, uh, you know, talking about our relationship in the booth for 14 years, he said, Zach, and I'm paraphrasing, he, he pretty much said, like, I hope that when Edzo is 65, he has somebody that takes care of him as he is taking care of me. And I thought, wow, like, you know, where's that seal of approval? You know, where's that? I said, that's like, that's the ultimate compliment coming from a guy like Doc Emmerich and who yeah. has been the ace and voice of hockey for, you know, a thousand years. And uh, we miss him every day, but, uh, you know, he's happy and that's all that matters. And uh, uh, I always get the chance to call him and hear his voice and hear his laugh and talk about the game and, uh, and what's going on. So, but he, he was a great partner. Um, there were times where I would just sit and marvel and just watch him and the preparation and the, the love for the game and love for people. And, uh, he was, uh, just, uh, I've been very blessed, uh, very blessed at work with doc for that many years. And I do local games here in Chicago as well, Zach, where my yeah. home is, I do the games for the Blackhawks. I've been here since, uh, from since 06 as well. And, I've been working with the great Pat Foley, who's a legendary Hockey Hall of Fame broadcaster. So I've been pretty lucky to sit next to two Hall of Famers uh, the last little while. And uh, I guess I know how to I, I guess I know how to keep company because, uh, you know, it's fun to be with guys that uh, are legends uh, in their own right. And uh, it's been a real pleasure to be. Well, you're with gonna, I mean, you're going to end up there, too. <laughs> yeah. Well, some some people some people may say maybe the Hall of Shame, but uh, you know what, if I could. If I can make it halfway there, then uh, then uh, I've I've done some good. So I've been very lucky. And uh, look, we love the game. We're passionate about the game. And uh, I think you know, the, I, I try to tell young broadcasters uh, um, when I talk to them or they communicate with me, Zach. I always just say, look at you know, you you are there to tell the story, not be the story. Now you can have an opinion. Um, you know, that's part of your job. You're there to describe, you're there, you know, my job as an analyst is to tell people why, but you're there to tell a story, not be the story. And, you know, I think sometimes, you know, look, it's hard not to get emotional sometimes, but it's not what you say, it's how you say it. And I just try to let, you know, let young broadcasters know is look at like, you know, how, how can I separate, separate myself from everybody else? And um, I've been lucky enough to have some great mentors and uh, certainly sit next to Doc and Pat for, all of these years has certainly helped me become a better, not only broadcaster, but I think overall, uh, you know, life skills as well of, of being around them on a daily basis. And before you were a broadcaster, Eddie, you were a player for quite a while as well. Yeah. And we brought up the Broadcasting Hall of Fame, which I do think you'll be inducted, but it wouldn't be the first Hall of Fame that you've, that you've been uh, placed into. You're in the United mm -hmm. States Hockey Hall of Fame, uh, inducted back in 2013, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, you know, tell me about that. But what I really want to know more is because, you know, this podcast thus far has been 90 percent Canadian. Uh, <laughs> you know, when you come in as an American, um, is there is there a different attitude that you bring? Because, uh, you know, I'm sure that at that point, the Canadians were like, this is our game. How dare you Yankees try to play it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, look, at I, I, I left home when I was. 15 turning 16 to go play junior B hockey in Stratford, Ontario. Can, I, can and, we talk about Stratford for a second? Because I was reading about the Stratford Cullitons. Yeah. Is that what? Yeah, Cullitons. Yeah, Cullitons. Yeah. Cull yeah. Cull yeah. 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 And I, I was like, what, what is a Cullin? Yeah. And it's the last name of uh, uh, some brothers that sponsored the team. Air, 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 air conditioning guys. Yeah. Air yeah. Air conditioning guys. Yeah. Yeah. And it, they're, they're called the Warriors now. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah but yeah. that was the first team that I'd ever heard that was just, um, just like named after a couple of, a couple of dudes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. They were the sponsors and, and I was looking for a place to go because look at, I was an American born player. And again, I'm, mm. I'm going back to the early eighties. And, you know, at that time, the majority of hockey players and a majority of executives were Canadian and they were like, well, you know what? Canadian players are here and everybody else is down here. So it was like, yeah, you're a good player here, but let's see how you do. And, you know, when you get up north of the border and my parents allowed me to go up to Stratford and play junior B hockey, I wanted to keep my college eligible eligibility alive. So I went up and played junior B hockey uh, up there and probably was the best thing that ever happened. I left home when I was 16 and 15 and turned 16 when I was there and 
that was playing against, you know, old guys at 17, 18, 19, right. 20 league. And I uh, went up there and, 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 you know, had to face that, uh, you know, uh, you know, Yankee verbiage and, you know, American verbiage and, you know, you're not going to take jobs away from us type of mentality, but, you know, for me, it was a stepping stone to whatever was going to happen the following year. And it just happened. And I got an invitation to try out for the Olympic team, as I mentioned a little bit earlier in the summer of 1983. But, you know, I was drafted in the first round by the Toronto Marlboros in the, uh, in the OHL in 83. I was drafted in the second round in the Quebec league by uh, the Laval Titans of the Quebec major junior hockey league. And that team actually had, uh, had Mario Lemieux mm -hmm. on it, Mary playing in Laval at the time. And the ownership group, Claude and Susie Fernell, who owned the team, came to Chicago. They came to my house. They had a uh, plastic bag of, uh, of uh, money in it. And uh, they came in and, and pretty much tried to, to buy my way into going into the Quebec League. And they wanted me to go play with Mario. And, I'm, and I always wondered if I would have decided to go to the queue, uh, you know, playing on a line with Mario, because I think Mario that year, the 83... 84 season the year we were both drafted in 84 i want to say that mario had like 290 points that I actually year. know the stats he had yeah. in yeah. 71 games he had 284 points yeah yeah two four 200. points a game yeah right and i thought well wow if if i would go to if i would go to laval like how many goals would i score you know what <laughs> i mean like how many like to be on you know so I eventually ended up playing with Mario when I spent some time in Pittsburgh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, but I always wondered if I would have went there, what would have happened? You know, like would have Pittsburgh love the, you know, I, I just, I envisioned the dynamic duo in Laval with, with Lemieux and Olchek and would Pittsburgh have tried to get the first two picks overall. And would we have both, both gone to Pittsburgh? You know what I mean? Like you just, you wonder how things kind of work out, but I ended up going to uh, the Olympic team. I made the Olympic team and, Obviously, I didn't go to play major junior, but, um, you know, that stepping stone of an American born player going to Canada, uh, it was a tough battle, um, not only hockey wise, but psychologically wise. And, and uh, you know, the, you know, the, the adversity and the potholes that were there, but it was a great experience. I would never have traded anything and in going into Stratford and seeing the support of getting 3,100 fans every Friday and Saturday night come watch us play hockey in there. And uh, the only year I was there, we went to the all Ontario uh, final uh, in the semifinals. We beat Craig Simpson and Craig Billington, two former national hockey leaguers mm -hmm. that played in London with the diamonds play junior B there. We beat them in a series and then eventually went to uh, we played Henry Carr, a, t uh, a school in, in Toronto. We lost to them in the, in the championship, but uh, goalie Bob, Bob Asenza, my future teammate with the Winnipeg Jets, was their goaltender. And I think Pat Flatley played on their longtime NHLer as well. So uh, it was a great experience to go to Stratford and uh, very proud to have represented the, the city of Stratford. And then, you know, t talk a little bit more about representing the United States, the Olympics. I mean, that's, you, you see players, you know, in the NBA and the NHL now, yeah. um, you know, they've won Stanley Cups, supposedly the, you know, the ultimate um, trophy for an NHL player, but, uh, there's something different about having, you know, the chance to win a gold medal for your country. Yeah. I mean, just to give people a little history lesson, um, you know, we, we were the team in 1984 that had the, the task of trying to follow in the footsteps of the miracle on ice. Team yes. in <laughs> and, uh, you know, we could only equal what that, I mean, look at that team in Lake Placid in 1980, opened up the door for American born hockey players. Like it got the attention of the NHL said, Hey, you know what? Like there's some pretty damn good hockey players that are playing in the U S I mean, you know, whether it was Neil Broughton or Mark Johnson or Kenny Morrow or Mike Ramsey, I mean, I, you know, I know I'm Dave Christian. I don't want to miss anybody, but you know, I mean, like those guys opened the door for us. I mean, they did. Yeah. And, you know, to have represented our country in the sporting world, in 84 and look at, I was only 17 years old. I made the team as a 16 year old. I played in the Olympics when I was 17. Uh, you know, we didn't get off to a great start. We lost to Canada the very first game. We lost four to two and that just put us behind the eight ball. And, you know, it was ended up being disappointing and we ended up finishing in seventh place. But um, I, look at that, that helped prepare me for the NHL. 
uh, Zach. We played a 65 game schedule that year. We played in the Central League, minor pro hockey. We played, I think, 24 games in the Central League, and we were playing against minor pro players. So, again, I was 17. We were playing in Oklahoma City and Colorado and Salt Lake and Tulsa. I mean, we were, you know, I was playing against pros when I was 17. So that really helped me prepare for the next season of playing in a National Hockey League. And I would never trade it in at all for, for anything in the world. I mean, I, I, some of my, some of my favorite pictures I have, you know, are, are from that Olympic year. I mean, I got a chance to, to meet, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan, the president and, and wow. be at the white house and every, everywhere we went, Zach, that year, wow, the, the, the 84 Olympic teams coming, the men's Olympic hockey teams coming and everybody just was like, Oh, wow. Let's throw a party. Let's have a parade. Let's give you a key to the city. Let's have a lunch. Let's meet the mayor. Let's meet the deputy governor. I mean, so it was, you know, it was a circus. I mean, it, it was, there was so much going on, you know, and I was just actually looking for that picture where I'm shaking hands with, uh, with president Ronald Reagan. I thought it would be pretty cool to show, but can't seem to find it right now, but you know, like it was, you know, it's just one of those things where um, it helped prepare me for pro hockey. And uh, I, I would never, would never change that experience for, for anything. And it's, it's, a, it, might, it might be a weird sentiment, but it might be a blessing that you didn't repeat the miracle on ice. Cause I, I, I had Mark Johnson on a previous episode and while like who, it's the, the most iconic team uh, perhaps in American Olympic history. But when Mark made the transition then from Olympian, very famous Olympian, like you mentioned, shaking hands with the president, right, getting a parade in DC. And then suddenly he's a penguin. He ended up actually being on my dad's team. Right. So uh, after the game, you know, even if he's only picking up nine, 10 shifts, all the reporters are there. There's just, there was no anonymity and all the expectation from, for those, you know, young Olympic guys to then go in the NHL and just recreate what they had in Lake Placid. Right. Yeah. I mean, look at they, the, you know, they, like I said, they opened up the door for us uh, as American born players, the attention they got and rightfully so. I mean, you know, look at, I mean, you could say it was the, the, you know, the greatest upset in, in all of profession of all of, of all of sport. Now our players at that time were amateurs. Everybody else was getting greased and everybody else was getting, paid yeah. for Olympics. <laughs> and, and, you know, people ask me like, you know, you played as an amateur, would you have played as a pro? Like I probably would have played as a pro, but I believe is that the Olympics should be for amateur players. I know it's changed now and in, in, in money certainly has a lot to do with it and the impact of the NHL and, and whatever. But uh, like for me, it helped me, it opened up doors for me and look at it opened up doors for those guys as well. Not only to play in a national hockey league, but yeah. here we are what 40, whatever it is, do the math 41 years later and sit here and go, Wow. When you, when you start reeling off names, people sit there and go, wow, you know, Ruzioni, uh, Jim Craig, yeah. uh, you know, Jack O'Callaghan, a former teammate of mine. I mean, you know, he's Mark Johnson and, you know, the, Neil Broughton, Phil Vercota. I mean, you just keep going on and on. And um, uh, it just like it, it, it was just an amazing experience. And still to this day, it, it still opens up doors for, you know, for a lot of those players and for USA hockey. I am a, I'm really divided on a point you just brought up, too that the Olympics should be for amateurs, not mm -hmm. NHL players, you know, going and playing or NBA players going and playing. Uh, I, the, the original dream team for the NBA, that, I mean, that was just to see like bird and magic and all that yeah. play together was just remarkable, but they've done it so many times now. It just, I would rather just see kids. And I think I would say the same for the NHL. It's so great for the league because you have, you know, the Sidney Crosby's on the world stage and 10 times as many Americans, especially are watching hockey than normally. Right. But on the other hand, yeah, I mean, there's not gonna be a miracle on ice when you have that, that sort of lineup. Um, yeah. When you have pros against pros. Yeah. I mean, look at the Olympics are for the best athletes and, and, and look at just let's, let's be honest is the best athletes are playing in the NHL and that's what it is. And for our country and, and for Canada's, you know, I mean, look at to compete against the, the world's best. Now it may be different in hockey. Look at, I mean, and we're going to get, we, you know, we had a taste of it in the last Olympics and then we might get a taste of it here. You know, it depends on if the NHL does indeed go to the Olympics mm -hmm. in China in February. Um, you know, you, your the NHL players are not allowed to go. Well then, you know, you're going to get the, you know, the, the so-called amateurism 
uh, of that, but you're still going to have minor pro guys go. You're going to have former NHLers that are probably going to be playing. So uh, in a perfect world, if, if I had a vote, uh, um, I, I would, I would like to see the Olympics be for the, you know, for, for the unknown. And then all of a sudden these players do become known, uh, you know, moving forward and, you know, opens up a door as it did for me, but you know, the world changes every day. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think it's going back anytime soon. And, the competitive nature of it certainly, uh, you know, sounds like uh, we'll we'll continue to have pros playing in the Olympics moving forward. Uh, last week I had on um, Bill Clement. Uh-huh. His career kind of mirrors yours a bit. He yeah. went, you know, uh, player turned broadcaster. Yeah. And one of the most interesting moments for me during that interview was I, I didn't realize I probably should have is that uh, after the second cup, he was the first Broad Street bully to be traded. <laughs> literally, literally two weeks, two weeks after the cup. So he got to have this utopian 14 days. And then it was off to the capitals who were just out dreadful at that moment. You got traded a bit. Um, when, when you, when you found out was, was, what was your reaction? Cause he was bummed. Uh, was there, was there just varying degrees of how you felt about knowing you're going to move on to another team? I'm sure some were exciting. Was, were there any that were like, Oh, come on. Well, you know what? I mean, I, I, I seem to wear out my welcome every three, three plus years. <laughs> uh, you know, if you looked at my back of my hockey card, um, but I, you know, I, I think the first time was really hard. I mean, look, I got drafted in my hometown. I mean, yeah. I was, I was the first American born native son to be drafted by his hometown team in the first round of the NHL draft in the history of it. So, you know, when I think about that, making history of, we talk about American born players, like it never had happened in NHL history where an American born native son was drafted by his hometown team and that'll never happen again. And I was the first one. And I'm very proud of that. Now for as proud as I was to have been that and drafted by the Blackhawks, uh, you know, three years later, uh, I was crushed, you know, like, I was like, Oh my gosh, I'm, um, you know, I'm leaving home, but look, there was a lot of pressure playing at home here in Chicago, Zach. I mean, mm-hmm. I kind of felt like I had, you know, 36,000 eyeballs on me every night at the old Chicago stadium. And there was a lot of pressure there. My first year was unbelievable. Uh, my second year was very good individually for the regular season and didn't have a great playoff. And then my third year, I just had a bad year. I mean, I don't know if there's a junior jinx, but I had it. I didn't have a sophomore jinx. I had a junior <laughs> jinx and uh, I ended up getting traded, you know, in September of that year. So, but what that did was, is I think it took the pressure off. I went to Toronto the next year and I scored 42 goals. I had my best year goal scoring wise yeah. in my career. So um, yeah, I think the first time hurt. Um, but after that, you know, I think I just realized, Hey, it's a business. And instead of looking at it, like, Hey, they didn't want me. Uh, hey, these guys want me and, uh, you know, and, and I'm going to go and play and, and play my game. So uh, it's a business. Like I played 16 years in the league. I'm very lucky. I mean, I played yeah. a boatload of games. I was lucky to be a very small part of a team that won a Stanley Cup with the Rangers in 94 and something I'm most proud of and, and um, something I would never trade in for. Uh, but, you know, the experiences, the relationships. Uh, I met my wife on an airplane my rookie year in the NHL and and here we are, uh, you know, almost, uh, you know, whatever, do the math, some 30, you know, seven years later of, of knowing each other and being married 33 years. Can you tell me about that? Did you, did you have some, do you have some game back then? How do you pick up someone on an airplane? Well, I mean, you know, I, I like to say I have a track record, but uh, the only, uh, you know, the only time, uh, as, as I say, uh, it was love at first flight. How's that, Zach? That's pretty good. Oh, that's pretty good. Uh, <laughs> my wife was a flight. She was a flight attendant, and picked we up were, the flight attendant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. So again, now we weren't. Flying. That's history. I mean, uh, your, your, your draft pick we, thing is fantastic, yeah, but that's really we, historic. Uh, we uh, we were flying commercial at that time. There were no charters back in the early eighties. Yeah. We were flying commercial. So we were playing a game Sunday afternoon. It was in January of 85, I believe. And it was an afternoon game in Chicago. And we had a game the next night in New York at Madison Square Garden against the Rangers. So after the game, we were driving to the airport to catch our flight on American Airlines. And 
there was a bad accident on the highway on the Kennedy Expressway leaving downtown Chicago. And I'm a rookie in the NHL. And I was told from day one, if you're not five minutes early, you're five minutes late and don't ever miss a bus or a plane. I'm like, so quite frankly, I must have, I probably could have got 50 tickets uh, going to the airport because I don't want to miss the flight. So long story short, I got to the airport and half the team missed the flight because the accident just stopped traffic and whatever. So I happened to get on the pl- on the flight and my wife was living in New York. She deadheaded from New York to Chicago, meaning she just flew as a passenger to work the trip back from Chicago to New York. That was kind of her, her turn. And uh, they had called her like two hours before that flight to work that flight. So I think about it, it's like, well, she, she got the call to work the flight. Somehow I made the flight. And when I got on the flight and I saw her, uh, her name is Diana and that's my mom's name. And my dad is an Ed, uh, and, you know, Ed or Eddie, I'm an Eddie as well. And I thought, wow, this is crazy. And then I saw her, her, her maiden name was Vickers and the street I grew up on for half my life was Mick Vickers. I'm like, wow, this is like, this is crazy. Like, mm, I mean, that is weird. I fell in love with her as soon as I saw her and then I talked to her and you know, I, I did a little smooth talk and I was a smooth operator. <laughs> next thing you know, we went on a date a couple of months later and uh, the day after we went on our first date was my very first playoff game. And uh, all I will say is I scored two goals in my very first playoff game and uh, the rest is history. So yeah. four, four kids later, a granddaughter, one year old, and we have a, a grandson on the way coming in September. So congrats. Uh, Thank you. As I say, uh, I've had a lot of great things happen, but the best thing that ever happened is that uh, I met my wife on uh, on a flight to New York, uh, my rookie year in the NHL. Wow, even better than the cup. <laughs> yeah, when I when I look at, when I look at when I look at the complete package under the umbrella, Zach, uh, the run uh, that was uh, that was the best thing that ever happened to me playing hockey, no doubt. Let's talk about the second best thing then, the cup. You did win yeah. the cup. Your, your name's on the Stanley Cup. Uh, where's the ring? Did you wear it? My ring is over here. Uh, actually, you know what? I know Flyer fans are going to really enjoy this. But, uh, <laughs> yes. The 94 so, Ranger Stanley Cup team. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, my, uh, my, Ranger, my Ranger ring right there. Yeah. Yeah, my Ranger ring. I, mm-hmm. I wear it... Um, I wear it uh, here. I'll even prove it. So it should, if you can see the old check on, I can there. see it. But yeah. So, um, I don't wear it a lot, um, wear it on, you know, on, on special occasions. Um, but look at when, when I, when I think about that, like is a player, and I'm sure your dad could, you know, can relate to this. Like you think Zach, you know what it takes to win but you don't realize how hard it is to win until you actually attain it, you know? And to me, that was, even though my role was like very tiny on that team, um, it was like, it was the most unbelievable experience that, that I had as a, as a, as an athlete. It was just like, you're on top of the world. Now that year in 94, like, you know, we had the best team. And the Rangers had one since, yes, 1940, Flyer fans, yes, 1940. Um, but we knew we had the best team and we had to go out and prove it and we were not going to be denied. And even when we were down three games to two against the Devils in the conference finals, playing in that game six, and that was the game that Mark Messier predicted that we would win and guaranteed it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that happened to be the only game that I played in the playoffs that year was that game six. Um, it just like you need everybody, Zach. Like it, 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 hockey is the ultimate team game, and whether you're the star or you're that twenty third player, like I was, you just never know when you're going to get the tap on the shoulder and go, "All right, you're up. Let's go." You got to be ready, and uh, the sacrifice, uh, you know, not only athletically but you know, family wise too. I mean, you know, like the families were a big part of it, and. Yeah. And they certainly, you know, share into it. But uh, everybody has a role, Zach. And I, and I always love to say is that when you have a role, you got to do two things. You got to accept and you got to execute. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were able to do that in 94. And uh, and here the Rangers are 27 years later still waiting. Still to looking win. for another one. Yeah. There's well, it's, it's even longer. For, 
right yeah, now yeah. it's it's Madison Square Garden that's got the the, the 1975 chants going. Yeah, and Flyers come to town. It's been a while, yeah. and that '75 yeah. team. You know, you, you mentioned that everyone has a role, and yeah, you, you know, your favorite player was Bobby Clark. He was yeah. one of the stars, stars yeah. of the team. But it's it's amazing the reverence and the fandom surrounding every every member of that Broad Street Bully team. Yeah. You know, I, I mentioned Clement. He had one goal in that playoff series, mm-hmm. but it's, it's in, the, in the second cup playoffs. But he's as loved and revered. Bob Kelly. <laughs> maniac yeah. not a superstar dave schultz had his role my dad uh, yeah. still gets uh, tons of compliments for being that right. third line center that you need to win and uh yeah i i love that you put it that way that everyone has everyone has a role and you need every single person to play that role because actually yeah. two weeks ago i had dave brown on who got a cup yeah. with the oilers and his role was enforcer right um you, you're not going to get you're not going to you're not going to sell as many jerseys being an enforcer as you are Gretzky, but it was his job. And yeah. uh, he, he executed and also got himself a cup because he accepted his role and he executed. Yeah. And, and you're right. I mean, you know, the, the, you know, that team or teams that win, you know, those players are revered the rest of their lives. I mean, mm-hmm. they are. And, and I just know that anytime that I go back, to New York as a broadcaster or, you know, a fundraiser or an event for the Rangers. I mean, there isn't a time that I'm not, you know, whether I'm doing, I do horse racing as well on NBC as a, as a handicapper. So, I mean, I get to New York a lot and run into Ranger fans. I mean, even I was in New Jersey this past weekend at the Haskell in Oceanport, New Jersey, and uh, there are a bunch of Ranger fans coming in and, and uh, you know, thanking me for 94 and whatever, like there isn't a time that I don't get to New York or being around that, you know, that so-called metropolitan area where there aren't people that are just, you know, thanking me and, you know, telling me stories about, you know, man, my, you know, my dad passed a couple of years after that. And he was the happiest time of his life is when his favorite team won the cup. And, you know, I'm sure for your dad and for, you know, all those fire guys, you know, they still, you know, like they, they hear those stories all of these years later, which is kind of, amazing and and it it makes you feel good and and that's why you play is is to win and uh it's not because of the it's the perks or you know uh you know somebody buying you dinner every once in a while or the free golf games or whatever it's just like you know what like you did it and you made people feel good about themselves and it's something that uh, they'll remember the rest of their lives and um it's just it's it's great to it's great to have been a small part of that team it is great and it's it's something only sports can do. It's the sports is the only thing that can truly unite a city. Uh, yeah. I've lived in cities where people hated each other every single day, except on Sundays or you know whenever <laughs> whenever the team that was winning. I, I happened right. to be in Kansas City uh, when the Royals won uh, back in 2015, mm-hmm. and every single person was your friend. Mm-hmm. You know, and then as soon as the baseball season's over, we would all we start fighting about politics and again. But if you saw another. <laughs> Guy or girl in a blue hat with a KC on it, buddies right. immediately. Uh, that yeah. that is when people say yeah, high, fives, like, high fives everywhere, right? Everywhere. The, the the parade was tremendous. I was thrilled to finally like be able to participate in something like that. And it is it is the only thing in the world that can do that. Um, can we talk a little bit about you know your arguably your greatest triumph, um, yeah. beating stage three colon cancer? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, you hear often that there's these five stages of grief when, when you, when you get a diagnosis like that, Eddie, is, is that true? Did you go through different stages and, in, in trying to process how, how to just, I don't know, absorb and make do with a piece of information like that? Yeah. Well, there's a lot there. I, I mean, I think initially it's, uh, you know, for me, I got to just tell the story. Look at, I mean, I woke up one day and I was constipated. I couldn't go to the bathroom. Now I was 50 years of age. Mm-hmm. I hadn't had a colonoscopy yet. It was recommended at 50. I had one scheduled for a couple of months later, which would have been probably about 13 months too late, you know, later than I was supposed to, but it wasn't like I waited five, six years. Um, I woke up the one day I couldn't go to the bathroom. Not normal, but I thought ah, maybe something just clogged me up. Now I went two days and now I felt like I had to go, but I couldn't go. Then I started kind of worrying. So like a typical guy, I went to the Walgreens and I got some prune juice and Metamucil and was like, okay, I'm going to work this out and everything's going to be fine. And I'm going to get on with my life. That wasn't happening. And that's when something went off, like there's something wrong. 
And quite frankly, it's like, look at, if it's not going out one end, it's coming out another end. And I got violently sick, uh, you know, like 50 hours later. And from the initial time when I woke up that two days before and my buddy who was staying with me rushed me to the hospital and uh, I had a high temperature and long story short in the hospital, they were like, okay, well, you have a blockage in your colon and uh, we're going to need to go get it. And then we're gonna have to do surgery. And then I'm like, whoa, like, you know, all of the surgery, well, you know, so I got shifted down to Northwestern hospital in, in downtown Chicago from the sub suburban uh, uh, hospital that I was in. And, um, they did a, you know, they did a quick scan, they cleaned me out and then they went in and they told me that I had a tumor the size of my fist and they were going to send it out for, you know, a biopsy. And then we were going to go from there. And then I had a six and a half hour surgery to remove that tumor. And in between that day and three days later, and I finally got the call at August the 7th, I'm sorry, on August the 4th at 7.07 p.m., my phone rang on a Friday night here in Chicago in 2017. And usually when you get a call from the hospital after seven o'clock on a Friday night, it's probably not a good thing. And uh, Dr. Scott Strong was on the other end and he told me, um, you know, your test came back and you have stage three colon cancer and uh, we're recommending six months of chemotherapy and we're going to reassess you after that. And the first thing I thought of, Zach, was, well, how long do I have to live? And then I thought, how am I going to tell my kids? And how is that going to affect them the rest of their lives? And like, it's just so many emotions happen. And, you know, when that happened, I, my wife was with me and, you know, I cried and she cried and said, we're going to do this thing together. And we walked down and our kids were at home and you know, out of everything that happened, that was probably one of the toughest things I've ever had to do was, and I think my wife probably prepared the kids, my four kids for it, Zach, honestly, that, you know, like, look, like this is probably looking like it's cancer. But um, when I went down there and told them, you just like the last thing you ever want to do as a parent is to uh, scare your kids or make them worried or, or rock their world. And, and that's what I kind of felt. And then I'm like, well, could I, could I pass this on to them? Like, you know, how, how will this affect them? um, medically, you know, like, is this something that, yeah, I absorb, but did I, you know, did I infect them with this and are they going to have to deal with cancer somewhere down the road? So, so many emotions. And then you start your chemotherapy and, and quite frankly, Zach, when I got the treatment too, uh, I was taking 48 hours of chemo as well as taking a five hour chemo uh, before I would went home. I had a fanny pack was connected to my chest. I had a port in my chest and I was getting zapped for 48 hours. When I came home from treatment two in uh, the second week of September, it was September the, uh, September the 25th. It was the first day I was home from the hospital and I just, no other way to say it. I just shit the floor. Like I just, I just couldn't hold it. Like I just, and I had a blood clot. My nose was bleeding. Mm. Uh, I had a headache. I had neuropathy in my hands and my fingers. And I'm like, I can't do this anymore. I quit. Like I just, I was ready to quit. Like I was ready to die. And my wife looked at me and I got the greatest inspirational speech I ever got in my life. And with me wanting to quit and being scared, um, my wife grabbed me and, and said, look, you got to fight. Like you got to fight for me. You got to fight for our kids and you got to fight for all the people that love you. And we had a moment, Zach, down in our basement that, uh, that lasted uh, 30 minutes. I cried for 35 of it. And I'm like, okay, it's hard. Uh, I'm just going to go day to day. And I think yeah. I put my hockey helmet back on. I'm like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, for as scared as I am, and for as much pain as I'm in, I'm going to put my hockey helmet on. And I'm not going to worry about what's going to happen in treatment five or 10 or you know, six months from now, I'm just going to worry about getting through today. And then when I wake up tomorrow, I'm going to put my skates on and I'm going to tie them up and I'm going to get ready and I'm just going to play the day and I'm going to get ready for the next day. And honestly, Zach, if, if my wife was not around, if I was by myself, I would have quit and I would not be here today. I know that because it tests your will to live. And that's not just cancer. I mean, you talk about any medical condition. Sure. Um, the support I got from the hockey community, the horse racing community, obviously my family, my wife, um, 
my team of doctors, I had an unbelievable team of doctors led by Dr. Michael Terry, who's the lead Blackhawks physician. And, and he kind of got the team together with Dr. Ruckham and, and Dr. Mulcahy, my oncologist. So, you know, once I got through that second treatment, I just had, a, I had a better feel about myself and I just started thinking. And, and the one last thing I'll say about this is, is even though with all the pain I was in and I wanted to quit and I was scared and I didn't want to die. Um, two things. One I, is, is I felt like I could be example for somebody out there. I felt like I could inspire somebody with my story. I wanted a battle for the next person that was going to be infected because cancer, as you know, doesn't discriminate. Like it hits mm -hmm. every type of person in the world. And in saying that, Zach, I, when I was going through my toughest battle, I was very much at peace, meaning I learned at a very young age that, and I don't know how I learned it or where I learned it, but I feel like it's one of my qualities is I've always let the most important people in my life know how I feel about it. Whether it was my, you know, we all have a circle, mm -hmm. whether it was my immediate family, very close coworkers, former teammates, very close friends, I've always said, hey, look, I just want to let you know that my life has been better with you in it. And I just want to let you know, because, you know, no pun intended, like, if I would not be here, it would kill me that you didn't know how I felt about you. And every, you know, everybody from my wife on everybody, don't talk like that. Nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to happen. But I've mm -hmm. always done that. And maybe that was a precursor, Zach, to what I was going to be faced with down the road. And I was very much at peace once I got through that second uh, chemo session where I could take a deep breath and like, look, at, if it's not meant to be, I'm at peace because my family, my friends, and the people I care most about know how I felt about them. And that's kind of like the life lesson that I've continued to, to, to preach. Um, if you can see over my shoulder, I wrote a book over the course of the last two years, uh, beating, the, beating the Odds in Hockey and in Life. And I talk a lot about the cancer battle. I talk a lot about the, um, the pressures that you're under and the caretakers and the caregivers who are the unsung heroes in this. And, you know, we not only have to, Zach, take care of the people that are ill, but we also have to make sure that the caretakers are okay. Because look at I never, my wife was with me every second. I, I never saw my wife weak. I never saw my wife cry. I never saw my wife worry when she was around me. Right. But I know. I mean, and I've been called an idiot, and and rightfully so. I know that I'm sure when my wife was not around me, I'm sure she let her guard down, and she was like, "Well, what the hell's going to happen to him?" And you know, be very emotional and what have you. But you know, we got to make sure that we're taking care of the caretakers and caregivers as well to make sure that they're okay because they may not be going through it physically, but mentally they are as well. So, I mean, there's just so much there. And the one last thing I will say, and you talked about like the, the steps and everything, and, and I don't talk about it in the book, which I wish I would have, and maybe there's an opportunity to write another chapter about this, but this is something that I've been dealing with and talking to people and, and it's, it's very common. And I didn't know about this. And so recently is that, you know, when you're so-called in the public eye, Zach, like I am, is my story was very public. And when you write a book like that, I mean, you're, you know, like the reason I wrote the book is like, I want to, I want to inspire one person to help them either him or her get through the battle, stay away from it or inspire them that, Hey, if that old broken down hockey player and horse player can get through it, well, I can too. And I'd like to think that I've had an impact on a lot of different people, but the one thing that that I didn't talk about in the book, which I think is very important, is that there is a there's a thing, there's a survivor's guilt that you go through or that I'm that you're, you know, you're going through when you're having gone through this. And it's not easy. And, you know, like because when you talk to people that have lost loved ones because of a battle, you know what they're thinking. Well my loved one didn't make it and you did, you know, like, it's just, that's just human nature, you know, and, and that has an effect on me. And, and just recently, uh, the hockey world, we lost one of the greatest guys in the world and Tom Curvers, who was a friend of mine. And I played with, I played with TK in Toronto and, and, uh, 
you know, I, when I was sick, TK was there every stretch of the way. And then back in January of 19, he called me and said, you know, Hey, um, you got a second. And when he said, you got a second, Zach, I, I hit the floor. I, I just was like, you know, please, no, you know, please, please don't. And, and sure enough, he said, you know, I've been having some problems in my chest and, you know, they're telling me they think it's lung cancer and, you know, and here's a guy that's never smoked in his life. And, you know, I'm just, you know, and unfortunately we just lost Tommy, you know, and, and, you know, there's just though that survivor's guilt kicks in at a high rate of speed. And, and uh, I just want everybody to know, like, it, it's anybody that's dealing with that. It's a real thing. And, and uh, it's okay to talk to people and, and uh, you know, you want to be there for everybody, Zach, but it's just yeah. hard to, to try to help people and, and walk them through because it's a very emotional thing. Well, yeah, I lost an aunt to cancer last year. And what would be helpful for me, because I didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. What was what was helpful? I didn't know what to say to her. Uh, my mm -hmm. mom was up there and they were like just the best friends. I didn't know what to say to her. Uh, so what, what I I just tried to be a distraction. I tried to make jokes. To, I tried to hey, you know do Zach, anything. Zach, Zach, it's a great thing. And I'm going to interrupt you there because I think that what 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 it look at when i was when i was ill and sick uh i love that my friends and my family would call me and and check in on me and bust my balls mm -hmm. and uh and uh you know like and just like obviously things are not normal but you want the same dialogue you still want the same love yeah. you still want the same uh you know uh attitude attitude amongst the people that you run with you know and you know look at yeah sometimes people don't know what to say but look at trust me it makes you feel good when somebody reaches out and look it's easy now i mean text email yeah. you know uh, insta face whatever you call it i mean you call you you know old-fashioned you write a letter i mean yeah. you, know, you do whatever um but i think it's just like look at it, it's nor you, you want normalcy when, when i was ill i wanted normalcy and it helped pass the time because as I said, and, you know, when I wrote the book, there's so many different things I've said, and I'm so proud of, but like having gone through that and I lived in our basement, probably 18 and a half hours a day, I lived in our basement. And as I say, and I said was, you know, I had enough quiet time to last me a lifetime. So yeah. it was, it was good. It was great to hear from, from Homer, from Jonesy, uh, you know, from my friends in the game and hockey and horse racing and, and, uh, but it's, it's, it's important to, to reach out and let somebody know, even if it's just Zach, Hey, I'm thinking about you, you know, it's just a text. If you don't know what to say, it's easy. Just send an emoji or whatever. Just say, hey, man, I'm thinking mm -hmm. about you. Hey, young lady, I'm praying for you. I love you. And, and uh, I'll, I'll look forward to seeing you soon. And like, it just, it, it helps pass the time. And uh, I know it's hard sometimes to verbalize, but I just think that most people when they're sick, at least when I was, uh, I just wanted the same, however you treated me prior, I wanted you to do the same thing. And that, that's, that's uh, what I thought. That thing is good for the soul, regardless of how, how hurt you may be. It's just, it's so weird because you know what's happening and it, it feels strange not to bring it up, but right. that was what I thought. Like if, if I had been, a, been in communicate with you while you were battling yeah. it, I, I don't think I would have brought up anything doctor related. I would have Ask you a Blackhawks question or yeah, ask yeah. you a doctor or a horse racing question. Yeah. We're gonna get we are gonna get to horse racing, but tell me about the moment, Eddie. You found out it's a it's all gonna be all right. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I went in for a scan and uh, and Doctor Terry uh, had a sneak peek at it before uh, my oncologist actually called me and he gave me the thumbs up and said everything was just clear and clean and. Like, it was just like, wow, I mean, I, I can't believe it, you know, like, and again, I mean, look, cancer is always going to be with me, Zach, I'm always going to have to go back for checkups, and then that's okay. And, you know, knock on wood, I've been clean and clear here for, you know, almost, you know, three plus years now. So, you know, from, 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 you know, from September 11th of, of 17 until, uh, you know, the middle of February, when I had my last treatment of 18, um, you know, it was a battle and a half, but, you know, for me at the end of the day, I've been very lucky and, you know, tried to la live a clean life. And, uh, but as I said earlier, I mean, cancer doesn't discriminate. Somehow I absorbed the gene and uh, I'm glad it was me. I'm glad I was the one that got infected with the disease. And because uh, knowing what I know now about it, um, 
quite frankly, it would kill me to see somebody that I love have to go through that because uh, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. And uh, like I said, it tests your will to live. And um, if, if there's one person out there, and I would encourage everybody to get a colonoscopy when they turn 45, um, it's peace of mind. Uh, that's the recommended age now. When I was sick, it was 50. Now they're recommending at 45. So please don't put it off. Um, cancer rates, colon cancer rates are going through the roof here over the course of the last five years, which they're trying to figure out why. Um, but um, I'm just, I'm very lucky and had a great team of doctors and great support. And uh, I know I wouldn't be here talking to you, Zach, today if, if I didn't have that support, not only medically, but also uh, family-wise and physically. Is it really true after you come through something like this, you have this renewed, renewed sense of zest for life? Did you, do you feel different or did you have that before? Honestly, Zach, you know what? No, I, I honestly, I, I don't. I, I, you know, look at, it. I mean, sitting in traffic, ah, big deal. Somebody cuts me off, big deal. You know, you got to wait an extra half hour for a table at dinner. Ah, so what? You know, maybe before that, I was probably a little bit more aggravated. Other mm -hmm. than that, honestly, I, I think what it did for me is it reassured me that I was in a really good place before I got sick. Uh -huh. And now knowing that uh, I was in a good place before I got sick. And, and then that's a great thing. You know, like I really, like I said, I've always let the most important people know how I felt about them. I, I mean, I never, you know, uh, I mean, I, honestly, I really don't. And there are some people that do. I mean, there, it's drastic. But there are people that I've communicated with, uh, specifically with cancer is like, you know what? I, honestly, I don't. I mean, I'm very thankful for my health. I always have, but um, I just, it just reassured me I was in a good place before I got sick. And, and, I'm, and I'm extremely proud of that. Your kids must have been so well behaved for a few months after that. Like, <laughs> I, I, I could have, I was such a punk teen, but if my dad yeah, had beat well, cancer, you know, I probably would have been was, a much I, more I well behaved them, boy. I, I, I give them uh I give him an A, I give him an A plus plus. And, and one of the things in the book was, um, it was, uh, my, my co-author there, Perry Lefko is an award-winning writer up in Toronto. I knew Perry from my days there playing with the Leafs and he's a horse racing guy as a hockey guy as well is he really wanted to get the, you know, instead of interviewing my kids, all four of my kids, I have three boys and a girl. Um, he, you know, we kind of brainstorm and then my wife suggested, well, why don't, you know, I mean, why didn't like, can they write something? Can they write? And I was like, there it is. That's it. So they all wrote a chapter on through their eyes of what it was. And, and the most feedback I get um, about the cancer battle. And yeah, I've got some hockey stories in there and horse racing, but the chapters that my kids wrote is kind of really where it, it, it hits a lot of people. And Zach, when I got the proofs of what my kids wrote, I didn't read it until the book actually came out. I, I did not want to, uh, <laughs> you know, like my son, Tommy, uh, he played his college hockey at Penn State. Um, he was the first division one a captain at Penn State when they had the men's hockey team there. And there was a time when, you know, Tommy pretty much got in my face and said, dad, you got to toughen up here. You got to, you know, you got to put your plums on the table and, and quit feeling sorry for yourself and let's go. Um, and he wrote that in there and I'm not saying that I would have taken it out before it went to print, but you know, it's just interesting to feel. And it was hard. I had to read a chapter a day because it was very emotional, obviously to have lived, you know, through it, through my kid's eyes and putting pen to paper. So, um, but that's the one thing I'm, I'm very proud of is that my kids had a very impact, a very big impact on the book. And I think it kind of just tied it all in together. Yeah. All right. Finally, Eddie, we got to get to your, your other broadcasting career, uh, horse racing. Exactly. Let me just tell you, like, I'm not very good on a technical side. All I know is this thing says 7% on my iPad. So I don't know how long that lasts, but I'm just letting you know. Okay. okay. This is gonna be, we, this will be just like a three minute wrap up. Uh, Eddie, just like that. I, I, I need to explain hockey to a lot of people. Yeah. You need to explain the world of horse racing to me because you're involved with the NBC broadcast. Yeah. So the biggest races of the year, yeah. The triple, um, the triple crown. Yeah. Uh, to me, it's just, it looks like ab absurd people in absurd outfits <laughs> um, getting hammered yeah. uh, for six hours before the race to watch about yeah. two minutes 
Yeah. Of uh, they usually like two year old horses. Uh, well, the derby, the derby is for three year olds. Three year olds. Okay. All ages. Yeah. yeah. Two to two to five, two to six. Yeah. yeah. And then wait again to do it all again next year. Yeah. What? <laughs> look at what? I, look at. I would say this. Like if if you, for the Kentucky Derby, I'm talking which is run on a first Saturday in May every year, except for during the pandemic year we ran in September, which is really kind of crazy. Um, if you love people, if you love the people watch, if you like to put on your Sunday best, I'm a non-drinker. I've never drank in my life. I've only drank three times or four times in my life. Mm -hmm. um, one out of the Stanley Cup. Uh, once when I was sitting on my dad's lap when I was seven years old. Once when I was a rookie in the NHL, somebody spiked my drink. And when my son got married a couple of years ago, those are the only four times that I've, wow. I've drank in my life. Now, if you like to partake in beverages and you like entertainment, the Kentucky Derby has got to be on your bucket list. Yeah, Churchill Downs, Louisville, Kentucky. It's a party and a half. I promise you, I guarantee you. Look, at, you don't even have to bet on the races. You don't have to know anything about horse racing. If you just like to have a good time, That's... I promise you the Kentucky Derby will knock your socks off. And then you'll sit there and go, I promise you, Zach, you'll sit there and go, how in the hell did I ever not, how in the hell was I not here before this? Yeah. So <laughs> it seems like, is it rich, rich NASCAR? Would that be like kind no, of? A, I don't, yeah. no, no, I don't think so. No, no, you have every, you have every demo, you have every age group, you have every, uh, different style you I mean you, whatever walk of life you have now you have more money you can be at higher levels of of, uh, of uh, stature and entertainment level of where you can be at the Kentucky Derby if you want to hang out in the infield and you can do that if you want yeah. to go in a clubhouse you can dress to the nines and you'll have an unbelievable time so it's uh, you know working for NBC the last seven years has been unbelievable because horse racing has always kind of been my passion and my love yeah but it's uh, when I tell people, if you go, I promise you, you will have a good time and you will want to come back. You'll want to come back again and again. So uh, long winded. If you're looking to do something, get on the blower, get on the World Wide Web and, and get some tickets to the Kentucky okay. Derby because it's a party and a half. Well, finally, a final question, Eddie Olchik. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining me. Who spiked your drink when you were a rookie? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't think that was too cool, uh, to be honest with you. Um, I was out at a mandatory uh, happy hour, and that's what used to happen back in the early 80s, is you'd fly in commercially. Before you got off the bus, one of your leaders would stand up and go, everybody in the lobby in 15 minutes, and everybody would go out together. We'd all go to the same place, and we'd hang out for an hour, and that's how you built camaraderie. I know that doesn't happen nowadays, and... You know, that's just kind of the world that we're living in. But uh, yeah, somewhere along the line, somebody, you know, spiked one of my drinks, which isn't very cool, but uh, nothing really happened. And uh, I still even even playing and living that era, uh, people ask me, I was like, how in the hell did you not? Yeah. Did you not partake and stay strong like that? And I'm like, well, that's just kind of my makeup. That is remarkable, Eddie, because I mean, there was there's beer. I had like three pictures of my dad still in uniform having a beer after a game. It, just, it was I, everywhere. It, it, was around. it, it was around, but yeah. you know, I never, I, I always thought as a kid and when I was, you know, I just was like, look, if, you know, if somebody doesn't like me for who I am or what I believe in, well, then that's, that's more their problem than my problem. But, right. you know, Hey, look at my, 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 my kids drink, my, my dad drank, whatever. All my, a lot of a majority of my friends all drank and drink mm. now, but you know, now I'm, you know, I'm an old guy, I'm a grandfather, and uh, I still have taken that, uh, that path of, uh, you know, being a non drinker. But after everything that I've gone through, and I wonder, you know what, maybe I should, maybe I should start drinking just to see how the <laughs> recorders live, have lived over these years. So. No, are you sure you've made the right decision? <laughs> Thank you so much for, for spending some time with me today. Um, congratulations on, uh, you know, your, your broadcasting success, the cup, Kids, grandkids, beating the cancer. You, uh, you've, you've put together something pretty special for yourself, Eddie. I appreciate it, Zach. Thanks a lot. Say hi to your dad. and uh, Certainly will. I do. I look forward to meeting you in person uh, sooner than later. So stay safe, and uh, uh, we'll look forward to uh, chatting with you soon. All right. See you, Eddie. Thanks, man. Thanks, Zach. Thanks a lot, Zach. See you. Yeah, thank you.